Well, I think we are in for a treat. Our guest this evening is Dr. Roy T. Ward, who uh, is familiar to many of you people. He's a re retired physician from Watkinsville, Georgia, who is a man of many talents, as I've discovered. The more I've heard, gotten to know him, and the more I've spoken about him, the more I learn of his many talents. Some of you may have read articles about his um, uh, reproducing or, or printing um, old glass negatives and of pictures that were made around the turn of the century, um, which I found fascinating. He's a painter, um, a keeper of much history, I think, and a quilt collector, which is what is dear to our hearts. Um, and I understand he's done some quilting himself. So. Well, we may mention that. <laughs> going to uh, speak to us tonight um, and show us his quilts. The title of his program is Quilts That Spoke to Me. So, Dr. Ward. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. <clears throat> well, it's a very handsome turnout, but I understand you have this good a turnout anyhow, whether I'm here or not. So, <laughs> so uh, I can't take any, any particular uh, credit for it. I'd like to introduce uh, uh, a few guests who have become because I'm here. Uh, Virginia and Chuck Dunn. Uh, Mrs. Dunn has been my, was my office aide intermittently for many, many years. And uh, 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 Chuck, her husband, and she and I have made some trips together, some of them to see quilts in Kentucky, as a matter of fact. Uh, Virginia works for a group of psychologists now, and Chuck works for Athens, Georgia Sanitation. If he doesn't get your water clean before you drink it, he tries to get it clean before it goes further downstream. <laughs> they, uh, they came in from High Shoals. And my other two friends came all the way from Mexico, the, uh, <laughs> the, the Ortegas. Well, y'all stand up here now, uh, Bernardo. Now, the, the plan here, it, it, I'll try to keep it moving as rapidly as possible. The plan, it, plan here is for me to hand them a quilt and uh, they will show it to you, hold it up, and uh, then we'll fold it loosely and drop it on the table, and I'll try to keep it moving. Uh, Bernardo, would you turn those two lights on, please? I failed to introduce the most important guest here, Bob Foster, who's in the back, who is videotaping uh, the, the, the program. He's made a couple of tapes with me before, and they've both shown on Athens television to my surprise and pleasure, and they've been very popular. So I said, well, let's, let's try for a third. Okay, Bernardo. The uh, quilts that have spoke to me. You know, uh, quilts photograph much better than they look. You could take a photograph of a very ragged quilt, especially if it's in color, and it won't look like it's got a hole in it. And that's one reason for the resurgence in the popularity of quilts. In about 1970, the Whitney Museum in New York showed the uh, Rothstein or Hofstein or something collection, which was largely Amish quilts, and presented them saying that they were almost equal to works of abstract art. Well, I thought that was really turning up things upside down. I, 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 uh, uh, I, I consider a quilt more valuable than a piece of most pieces of abstract art. Uh, but in reproduction, these Amish quilts, you know, look very much like the Joseph Albers homage to a square, 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 square. And they did look wonderful. Well, I'm sure they look wonderful in, in shall we say, in real life also, but they looked even more wonderful in calendars and books. And that sort of set off this resurgence of quilting, in my opinion. I had my first uh, showing of quilts in the mid-1970s. What set mine off was in part due to that notoriety, but uh, more due to something else. Uh, the, my Ward family home place had had to be abandoned and disposed of, and in the upstairs room, there were about seven or 17 trunks of various things. And uh, some of them were quilts. I had no particular interest in them. And I discussed this problem with my elderly aunt who was living with me. She said, oh, those are those old Tyndall quilts. Throw them out. Well, they were threadbare. Well, the Tyndall quilts were way back before the Civil War. And uh, they, they, they went out. They went to auction. I don't know who got them, maybe nobody. But I always... Uh, uh, 
had a feeling of loss, but I hadn't, there was really nothing else I could do at that time. I had a feeling of loss. A few years later, I bought an old house with the furnishings in it, most of them, and there was a homemade pine box uh, with quilts in it. Well, I, I decided I had room at last. I wouldn't throw them out. Uh, as we changed the beds on the metal springs, and I, it's hard for me to describe these springs. They were not regular springs. They were, they were more like a trampoline. Uh, uh, there was a piece of a quilt. And I, it was the basket design, the, the, uh, and I thought, now, you know, I could, I could paint that as if it were an entire quilt. Then I could throw it out and burn it up. <laughs> so I did that, and that got me started. And the first thing you knew, I had all sorts of quilts, basically to paint pictures of or to make, or to make, to make prints of. In time, though, of course, the, uh, I, I caught up, in, you might say, in the fever of it and began to appreciate them more for themselves. Well, we'd better move this thing along. Quilts that spoke to me, okay. Now, hold it up as high as you can, men. All right, the legend says, hold it up as high as you can. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, H-A-R-T, heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness, H-E-A-V-I-N-Y-S, is the heaviness of his mother. Now, I think that's a real profound and touching statement. I don't know whether it comes out of a Bible or what, but it's a very profound statement. When this you see, remember me, though I may in eternity be. I used to have a very difficult patient, Virginia will remember her well, who brought me that poem several times a year. <laughs> there, there are initials on it. I got this at a yard sale, but as a result of the date, 1839, and as a result of the initials, and knowing something of the families involved, we rather quickly ascertained who made this quilt uh, in the first place. And so uh, the... The, the descendants of that lady very willingly paid me back what I paid for it. So this is the only quilt in here that I don't personally own. It's not the only one that's ragged. I can promise you that. Okay, man, put it on the table. But some quilts speak to you and some quilts yell at you. And this quilt, you know, it, it, it was virtually yelling. See, here it goes this way. This this way. Now, we think now of the word crazy in a derogative way, but of course it didn't originally mean that. It meant crazed, like crackled. The uh, the, the splendid old antique. Uh, Chinese ceramics are often crazed, so it really didn't stand for you know out of your wits. It, it stood. It stood for crack. I love this also not only because of the what it is, but because you can place it in its milieu. It's 1913. I suppose that the reason the nine is reversed is is that all of you who make quilts have discovered it's hard to uh, it's hard to keep the reverse in mind when you when you're working from the back of something. It's Sometimes you make a mistake when you turn it over, it goes the wrong way. I don't know that that has anything to do with it. But to me, this again spoke to me, 1913. You know, that's just before World War I. And uh, society changed in World War I. And I, I think we see here the sort of thing that we picture in upright old ladies in black dresses, uh, 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 a, a kind of elegance but a very subdued elegance, uh, a kind of surety. Uh, there's no effort to be flamboyant. There's no effort to uh, show off anything. So this speaks to me very strongly of a time uh, before uh, the war. Okay, men. Now, I expect everybody that makes quilts knows about log cabin quilts. 
uh, which is basically, as, as you no doubt know, a string quilt, one of the easiest of things to piece, and certainly one of the easiest to piece on a sewing machine. This is only a top, as you see, but it's, it speaks to me loudly, partly because I had never thought about having this extreme variation in the width of the strips. And uh, it's, the same, it's the same difference that you see on a tile floor if it's come out of the machine age and every tile is exactly the same and what you see in a hand laid tile where there's a little variation. Uh, this, this, this variation between the width of the strips to my mind enhances it enormously. And if I ever piece one again, I have pieced one. If I ever piece one again, I'm going to try varying the, uh, varying the strips. Okay, man. Okay. You got it. Uh, this is a top that I pieced, and I, I show it not as an example of anything perfectly wonderful, but as an example of something that is potentially different. Uh, you all know that in piecing the square for the various log cabin straight furs and all that, you have two sides dark and two sides light. I've never known anybody who deliberately varied that. Now, this doesn't carry through as much as I thought, but it carries through enough where you can see what I'm talking about. One side is mostly dark, dark. One side is still dark, but it has light in it. One side is mostly light, light, and one side is still light, but it has some figures in it. Now, doing it that way, if you make two sets of squares, one a sort of a mirror image of the other, you can do something entirely different with it. Now in this, in this one, what I attempted, if you look at it long enough, you can sort of see it, but as I said, it wasn't really successful. There is a subtle alternate shadow coming this way. You kind of have to study it to see it. You might have to look at it with the eyes half closed. But there is, a, there is a subtle crossing shadow. Now, there are other things that can be done with it also if you'll make two sets of squares, one going clockwise, one going counterclockwise, or one as a mirror image of the other. And as I said, go through the tones as sort of four tones instead of just two. Okay. Virginia, you don't have to stand up there, dear. It's a... Now, this is what a lot of you fine quilters would call kind of a sorry quilt. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the lady who made that had an enormous family, and she, she was a compulsive quilt maker, and she just never stopped. And uh, so she, she, she took shortcuts. As you'll see, there's, all, there's, there's really no quilting on in all this gigantic space. But the... The integrity of the thing, it, it has a perfect integrity. This is exactly what she did. Uh, not the same pattern over and over, but uh, basically squares with this sort of crossing. And uh, the little Dutch girl, of course, is a, is a very famous design, and she's outlined it with dark. As I said, it has virtually no quilting at all, but it really doesn't need any. You know, it was for her children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, and where some people are satisfied to make one, I think she made six apiece, and uh, uh, it, I think it holds up quite well. She gave this to me, and I treasure it. Okay. Now, do we have satisfactory seating arrangements for, for what we're doing? Uh probably 20 years ago, 30, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, this is an example of a quilt that I don't know the name for, but you probably do. They, the, the pieces look too much like coffins to, be, to, to please me very much. But that's not what it's about. Every piece in it is different from every other piece in it. Now, if you study it long enough, you will eventually find one or two duplications, but it takes you a long time. And uh, so being a simple cut, uh, all of them exactly the same, it's the sort of thing that a lady could have all of her friends contribute a piece. 
and uh, uh, so with, but the, the the charm of it is uh, that it is truly a memoir. It's a truly a memoir piece, not done for its design, but because but because of of every piece in it being unique. Okay, man. Virginia, are you sure you want to do that? Now, this speaks to me because it's still got its first prize ribbon on it. <laughs> and I think it's 1959. 1959, the Athens Agricultural Fair. The, uh, the, 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 the prints are typical of the 40s uh, in, in the early 50s, as you'll agree. And uh, it does succeed, I think, because of the placing them on a light, light background. It's, Ida Bell Hillsman, Ida Hill, uh, uh, Lennon Cole made that and uh, gave that to me when I was in active practice. And of course, of course, uh, I treasure that also. Okay, man. Now this this rag speaks to me on several levels. For one thing, it looks very much as if one person made the squares, and then sometime later somebody else put it together as a quilt, and then sometimes later somebody else had to add on to it because it was so frayed. So I, I sort of see three generations of a de declining skill uh, in this thing, and. I contrast it as another reason that it that I wanted to show that well I may not have it with me it also illustrates the slide from small meticulous work to large less careful work I have another fan quilt which is made 50 or 100 years later with great big fans and not a not nearly as interesting. Okay, man. No idea. Another old rag that appeals to me the almost startling simplicity of that of that design, uh, which certainly goes uh, way way back I have seen a similar design in a book almost exact but not precisely exact now believe it or not this is a hard thing to figure out if if if, if you start if you if you take just just the design and don't have the pieces in your hand to follow the cuts and the stitches it's a darn hard thing to figure out uh, I, one of my very first block prints was of this quilt. It was, a, it was a simple one to print because it didn't require but two blocks. One orange type all over block, which didn't require any carving, whatever, and then a blue one, which had to be carved. Print the orange one, print the blue one on top of it, and the whole print is finished. And uh, so uh, uh, another thing, this is a, a faded quilt, but you people know something about it that I don't know that that wonderful orange color that goes through so many of these antique quilts uh, which faded less than almost any other colors in it I have one quilt with that orange color in it. this is not it which had been retopped and recovered in other words the top was a whole nother quilt and I tore off the top quilt and found the, the bottom quilt it was absolutely useless except as inspiration for a painting which I, and I did make a painting of it okay man Now, the, the basket quilt that inspired me to make my first painting was just a rag. I mean, it was really a rag, just a fragment. So it did go out in the trash after I finished my painting. But uh, uh, I was, became sensitive to, to uh, the basket design. Mr. My other guest, Mr. Billy Dawson, has, has come in. He came from Watkinsville. Uh, it can go either way. 
uh, it, it's being held lengthwise, uh, so I presume it went on the bed this way, but it, of course these baskets are sideways and those baskets are sideways. It's the only one I've seen that that made this particular arrangement, and I, I like it very much. Here again we have that perfectly wonderful orange color uh, uh, running running through it. This is Mr. Dawson's grandmother's quilt. Okay, man. Of course, you know, there are many variations of the basket design, and this one Some of them are very playful. I guess it goes this way. But this goes back to that, that serene elegance of some of the, uh, uh, early, of some of the early quills. Uh, I realize as we put this up, there's also a certain amount of you know, almost carelessness about it. It's, it's not split down the middle, uh, which is another thing that I like about these useful homemade things they 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 succeeded in elegance that's true but they weren't uptight about it <laughs> okay now this is a, a combination of a string quilt and squares and it still has its paper on the oh it, this is just the top has it says roebuck catalog papers on the back so uh that speaks to me of many things I think that if I were making quilts, which I'm not, but I think if, if I were, I could go on forever with the string quilt. There's, there's, there's just, uh, it's, it's limitless, you know, what, what, can be, what can be done with them. This, was, this, this made, was made by a family who busied themselves uh, at night uh, out, in, out, in, out in the country and made uh, worlds and worlds of uh, tops and then pieced them out with whatever they could get a hold of. But the, the charm of it, of course, is the, is the Sears Roebuck paper still on the back. I, I suppose you all know how you make string quilts on a piece of paper or a piece of cloth. Okay, man. Let's turn it the other way. When I, when I became sort of known for taking some old quilts, a, a few people would bring me news of them occasionally. And uh, a fella brought me news that a, that a police dispatcher down at Edenton who traveled North Georgia had made it a project to try to get an example of every pattern that was made. Well, he didn't know what he was getting into, did he? <laughs> Uh, he had acquired a room full of quilts. Uh, I was invited down to see them, and by that time I had way too many of what you'd call standard quilts. The only things that he had, and he, he wasn't cheap either, and the, the only, the only, he, well, he had died as his parents were selling them. The, the, uh, the only things he had that I could conceivably make any use of were these very old things, and as I said, I could always take a picture of them or paint them. Uh, I did paint this uh, uh, rather su rather successfully. Uh, you may not know unless I tell you this should be pink. This is uh, this the pink is all faded. Now this is a good time for me to point out a little indelicacy. Uh, the, the 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 symbol, whatever you want to make of it, but the symbol of the shaft uh, in the whatever you call it, ellipse, is a recurring thing since antiquity, really, in, in uh, your, your folk art designs. I think it's an absolutely unselfconscious, but still a real male-female symbol. But I, I, I think it's totally unselfconscious, but it recurs over and over. The, uh, the fine work of this and the fine quilting is quite interesting on this, the outlining of the the outlining of the shapes. This is basically, I believe, the rose design. It, uh, I think it occurs in English, in English designs too. Okay, men. Excuse me? Can you flip it so I see the back? Yeah, turn it around. Uh, 
Are we still okay on the seating and the, and, and the lights? Uh, who knows Spanish? <laughs> Reverso. Okay. No, there's no date on it. It's obviously very old. I think that the origins for, for quilt patterns uh, derive from several sources. And one of them, I'm satisfied, is the tile floors of, uh, of the old world. And uh, this is uh, said to be from Pakistan. It may not be, but it's certainly not American. The, uh, the, you see, that it's, a, it's, a perfectly, it's a design that we Americans use a lot, but it really looks like a tile floor. It's not, a, it's not our type of quilt. It appears to be over a very thin blanket. Okay. Another very old but degenerated quilt, but the, it still comes through as a powerful piece of quilt making. I felt inadequate to paint that one. I, uh, I had two assistants two or three years ago, two young ladies who were very meticulous, and I got them to paint kind of a miniature of it for me, but I've never tackled painting that one. Show in the back, so reverso, reverso. Okay. <clears throat> when we acquired the uh, the old house. Uh, this was one of the quilts that was in the in the box, and uh, I hadn't gotten really into uh, painting and, and uh, block printing the designs. And a uh, uh, colored lady friend of the family uh, was at, asked me if she could have some quilts, and I gave a couple, including this one. Well, I never got over it, so I eventually I eventually picked up one or two more and went down and swapped with her. <laughs> Uh, because I wanted to make a painting of this quilt and a block print, and I did. Again, we have this, this wonderful orange uh, uh, that goes through so many of the old quilts. Okay, man. This is said to be, as they all say, over 100 years old. Uh, and never and never used, and I don't doubt it. It's because it's in immaculate condition, but it is a wonderful example to me of the time when the pieces were small. You know, this pattern, churn or monkey wrench or whatever, this pattern is uh, uh, used a lot up to this day. But you hardly ever see one where the uh, where the squares are made that minutely. Okay, man. Goes, goes this way. Now, you know, one is not always known for what one would like to be known for. Uh, I, I, I practiced. I, I think I did a good job practicing medicine, and I think I get a, get a, did a good job in artwork. But when I got in the newspapers, it was for defending a flock of guineas. Had nothing to do with, you know, with what I considered my talents or my abilities, because it, that wasn't newsworthy. But to go out and defend a flock of guineas was newsworthy. Well, then, uh, so after that, I heard myself introduced at the university function as by one of the professors said, he's that quilter from Watkinsville. Well, at that time, I never had made a quilt, but uh, I decided after I got a garden and all that, you know, well, uh, it's nice to know how you go, how do you do things, you know. If you're going to paint a picture of something, you should know how it was done in the first place. 
So uh, I undertook to uh, to uh, 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 make two or three tops, and, and uh, I didn't do the quilting. I hired that, but I did. And it has interested me that with so much quilting going on, so much fine quilting going on, there's really not a whole lot of invention. There's a, a great deal of it either duplicates a previously known pattern or duplicates it in just a slightly different way by having 200 different shades of blue in it instead of just one shade of blue or something like that. So uh, what I've done here, uh, and it's not very fine work, I'd be the first to admit, but what I've done here is, is draw designs, make stencils and draw designs of things that suggested the vegetables and then pick out the material that suggested the vegetable. The tomato stem, for example, is a red material with a little blossom in it. I mean, that's not, that's not stitched in. The, uh, the cantaloupe figures, uh, they sort of suggest the roughness of cantaloupes and the, the uh, eggplant and the various kinds of, of squash. It was a lot of fun to do. Uh, I wish it was a better job than it is, but uh, uh, it, it might inspire some of you to uh, loosen up and, and uh, do some of your original designs. Okay. Now, when the Australian lady, Margaret Roth, was here, and uh, Priscilla Golly and her friend were kind enough to bring her out to, uh, to see me, we hit it off right away. But the reason we hit it off right away was that she was doing, in an elegant way, what I had already done in more of a crude way. And so I'm probably the only other person in the world she'd ever seen do it, so she was taken right away. Okay, these are all chickens. <laughs> now, some of them are fairly obvious. You know, this is fairly obvious, and this is fairly obvious. Some of them are not so obvious. Uh, some of them require two squares. Uh, some of them are crowing. Some of them are fighting. Here are two roosters fighting. Here's a mother hen settled down with, with a black chicken and a yellow chicken and another one sticking his head out from under a wing. <laughs> Hold it up as high as you can, men. Go up, go up higher with it. It takes a while to kind of get into it. Now, <laughs> Mrs. Roth was working with much smaller squares, almost like these computer things, so she was doing very rather exact reproductions of animals. Now... Hold it down again. If you can't figure this one out, then you don't know much about life. <laughs> All right. You could, you could put that one aside. Now, by adding just one square, you can do a great deal more. This is five squares instead of four. This represents a crowing rooster. <laughs> but uh, I wasn't into it strongly enough to make a whole quilt. But uh, it's just an example. You can go a long way, you know, with, with, this, with this idea if you work at it. My background, I looked up on a piece of fabric that was multi-tinted. These, these didn't have to be hand-dyed. Uh, I, I was able to get shades to, give a, to suggest a background without being so dull. Okay, man. Uh, the reason this this had this is uh, something that I pieced, but I didn't quilt. Uh, let's see, it goes. Let's go this way. Now, when the uh, one of the famous collections came to Atlanta, this design was in it, and it's not an unusual design, and I loved it. The uh, uh, if you. If you do it with most of your lights pointing up, it begins to suggest overlapping mountain ranges. It makes a nice wall hanging. Now, after it was done, I went to get a backing for it, and the backing that appealed to me was this, which is an English lion. So, uh, as I said, I, I engaged a quilter to, uh, to quilt it. So I impulsively gave it to friends of mine who live in England, 
and uh, they right away hung it upside down in their home. But it doesn't hurt to hang it upside down. It's just that... It's just that you get dark mountains instead of light mountains. And it never did look as good to me that, that, that way. Well, I eventually uh, gave those people uh, uh, something else of considerable value. And uh, they disappointed me so that everybody in it hated me after it was all over with. So I asked for my quilt back. They, they still complained that I didn't send them the postage for it. The, uh, after I was kind of known for, get, for collecting some quilts, I was referred to a lady up near Winder who had a vast number of what I'll call ordinary quilts, which she had made in very good condition. But my house was full of them by that time, and I really didn't need any more uh, like that. But before I left, she said, when I asked what else, she said, well, I've got a couple that my mother made, but you wouldn't like them because they've got stains on them. Well, little did she know me. Uh, <laughs> This is one of them. Uh, I don't know how one arrived at this sort of a design. It's five-pointed, so it's not, a, it's not a folded up piece of paper cut out. I don't know whether it ever came out in a newspaper or what, but uh, it's, it's, it speaks to me again. And again, we have this lovely uh, old orange and dark green, which seem to hold up no matter what. Okay, man. The other one that that, uh, that she had, which I was happy to acquire, those of you, those few of you who've been out to my house or been to any of my shows have seen both of these before because I always hang them. For one thing, they're small and easily easily managed, and another thing, they are, I think, so striking. The quilting is not outstanding, but again, it doesn't need to be. The... Uh, it's talking to you about the design. It's not talking to you about the stitches in the design. Okay, man. Now this is a Yankee quilt. It's it's thin as they are because they used them more for coverlets uh, winter and summer, uh, and uh, I've got a sneaky reason for showing you this. It is beautifully made, beautifully made. The fine stitching is so fine. I don't know whether I should tell you the reason or not. But uh, I, was, I was visited by a couple who were into quilt collecting. I mean, they came for the purpose of buying some quilts. Well, as Priscilla knows, I had seven trunks full by that time, as the joke goes, and it was pretty wearing, you know, going through, uh, going through these things. So they would say, well, now, how much would this one be, and how much would this one be, and how much would this one be? Well, soon, uh, and, I, you know, nothing was priced. I, I wasn't trying to sell them. And so soon they had about 15 or 20 figures going through my head, $150, two, $300. Then they would go back, and they would, they would pick out one and repeat the price 50 or $100 lower than what I had said. <laughs> they didn't admit that's what they would do. They just said it thinking that I wouldn't know the difference. Well, to tell you the truth, I didn't always know the difference, but there were one or two when I did, and I realized what they were doing. They were letting me confuse myself, and then they were coming back, uh, 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 quoting, quoting me, I should say misquoting me, $100 less than what I had asked. So I pondered that. These were, of course, university people. Uh, I... <laughs> I, I pondered that, and I thought, now, what should I do? Because, you know, it's not written down. I can't prove I'm right. So I finally said, oh, to hell with it, you know. Because I realized what they were doing. They were buying my quilts to trade up. These are fine quilts, but they're not museum quilts. And they were getting my quilts to trade up someplace else, you know, give four quilts for one and get a museum quality quilt. So the other one that's, that's not a mate to this, it's a different design, but it was just as beautifully made and came from New York State, I think. Okay, you can put that down. Now, I don't know how many of you are even old enough to have seen the Japanese movie Rashomon. It came out in the 50s became extremely famous and set the stage. It was one of the Kurosaga or Kurawasa, whatever, uh, movies, and, and set the stage for a number of fine movies made since then. 
the uh, the presentation of the movie was that a, a crime takes place. A couple on a journey somewhere get ambushed and uh, a, a murder takes place. The, the husband is killed. And so uh, the, the authorities and the people try to solve, you know, what happened. So the movie then shows each person's story. And each person's story is different. The, uh, the woman who did not get killed tells a story, which is not right. The, uh, uh, somebody else who was there tells a story, which is different. Somebody else tells a story. So in the end, a psychic is called in. A medium is called in. So this takes place in one of the lovely sand gardens of Kyoto. She goes, oh, 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 oh. And then the, that story comes out, which is the true story. And it's pretty awful what it is. But uh, uh, a, this quilt... Oh, these quilts spoke to me from the spirit world. They are not real. Can y'all hold that up? I made these up for a lady that's crazy about cats. And I would challenge any of you, if you want to get into a, a applique quilts, I would challenge any of you to get into something like this. It's really lots of fun. Can you go any higher with it? Now, they're not so much fun to paint, but uh, if you were to look at it closely, you will see that I have represented printed fabrics, and in this I've represented white fabrics on a, on a neutral background. But it's the, it's the sort of thing I would, I would challenge you to be not only the careful workers that you are, but also to, to be inventive workers in a, in a very personal way. Okay, men, you can set that down. And you can step down now, both of you. Thank you, Bernardo. I expect I took a little longer than you would have liked, and if so, I apologize.